Okay. This is a little bonus content for everybody. Woohoo! Bonus content! Yeah! I feel like I would be remiss to not talk a little bit about the polyvagal theory. So that's what this bonus content is going to be, bonus episode. The polyvagal theory is one that comes up a lot. If you take trauma-informed coursework, uh, if you do any trainings, you'll probably see it. It was developed by uh, Stephen Porges. He put out a really great paper on it in 2009 that I read. And I really like the theory. It's actually really great. However, in looking through newer research, I encountered areas of contention with it. Uh, People have issues with it. And essentially, it's not totally proven to be accurate. And we don't even really know if it applies to humans. We see evidence for it in certain animal models. But we don't necessarily see the evidence outside of like behavioral theory. We don't see it in humans. So the thought is humans likely have more complex uh, nervous system organization. And therefore, there's likely other things involved with our survival mechanisms than just the vagus when it comes to the sensory uh, or the pathways that are mitigating the different responses. So essentially... Polyvagal theory is a way of describing the reason that fight and flight are physiologically different from freeze response. That's essentially what this theory is doing. It's trying to explain, it's kind of presenting a model of explanation, a potential explanation for why these things look different. In this theory, it states that there's two branches of the vagus nerve. There's the ventral vagal complex, the VVC. This one is the one that is involved in the fight or flight system. It downregulates the connections from the midbrain to the neocortex. So this is the one that starts to turn down those, those connections between like amygdala and anterior cingulate and stuff like that. Okay. And then there's also the dorsal vagal complex, the DVC, and this is involved in the freeze response. So this takes over if fight or flight fails and then the ventral vagal complex turns off. Okay. So that's, that is what this is talking about. All right. Um, I'm actually, I think I'm just going to read off. There was a, a response to a question in my, in my course where I just wrote out an explanation (laughs) of how this polyvagal theory is supposed to work in action. So I think I'm just going to read off some of this. It starts out with the description of the term neuroception. Neuroception was presented by Porges And in order to really explain it, I think it's best if I give you some clarification in terms of how the field of neuroscience defines things like sensation, perception, consciousness, awareness, stuff like that. Okay. So when you're talking neuroscience world and like research world, sensation is what occurs right when a sensory nerve gets stimulated. Okay, so that initial one, like for touch, it would be like that nerve that's being active and that's getting activated with that touch, okay? Like at the fingertip or something. That sensation, all right? The signal gets sent upward through that nerves into the nervous system, right? And that's where processing starts. Essentially, the second that signal leaves the initial receiving neuron and goes into a new neuron, now processing has started, okay? Because processing occurs in a lot of different ways. There's presences of like serial signals, parallel neurons, parallel pathways, recursive pathways, like kind of loopy doopy ones, essentially. That's where the signal starts to be processed. Perception on the most fundamental level, it does occur as soon as the signal is starting to be processed because you've fundamentally changed something about the signal. So something has changed. The signal's either been like strengthened or it's kind of like a filter. Like it, it's been sort of filtered somehow. So it's been processed. So that's why perception is so different from sensation, especially when you read about it in like neuroscience and physiology. Those are very different things. Okay. Because breakdown can occur anywhere up that processing chain and your perception is going to be really different, right? It might change the perception a lot. And there's a lot of research being done in this for the sake of like motorized limbs, essentially, like things like that, like being able to have the brain control um, implanted limbs for amputees and things like that. That's a lot of where this research is coming from because this incoming sensation and this processing is really important to how we actually access the motor. So it's kind of interesting. It's, it's really cool and fascinating stuff. I'm not going to go, I'm tr- going to try not to go down that, that uh, rabbit hole with you guys though, because <laughs> we would be here forever. 
So at a really fundamental level, your processing starts because of just your general neurological organization and animals and humans have different organizations. So this organization is a bit like how someone might organize their work files or maybe like create schedules and to-do lists, right? So everybody might have a slightly different way of doing it, but that's essentially what's happening. That signal it's being like organized and processed and changed up a bit. You might color code it, right? To make it more salient, things like that. Right. And so conscious awareness of perception though, of the perception of the signal, it really only occurs once it reaches the higher like cortical areas, those like five layer cortex, the neocortex areas, the frontal cortical areas. That's where we start to become consciously aware. That's where we're perceiving that initial sensation. Does that make sense? So when we're talking colloquially, you're talking about like your sensation, your sense, your sense of touch. Oh, I sensed that, you know, whatever. Uh, I said something was wrong with that person. Things like that. Like that's a colloquial use of the term. And then there's the neuroscience use, which is like sensation is literally like the moment that single receptor got activated and the signal was contained within that receptor neuron. That is sensation. And once it leaves that, it's being processed and it's going to change enough that perception is going to be a little different. And then you don't actually get awareness of perception until you get into those higher cortical areas. And that signal has been filtered through a lot by the time it gets up there. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's a little something about just how the nervous system organizes incoming information. So when the sensory information, when this processed sensory information arrives at the midbrain structures, our amygdala and our midbrain limbic system, so like amygdala, hypothalamus, hippocampus, that stuff, okay, it has been processed, right? But that information hasn't entered a higher level cortical area, okay? So that person isn't necessarily aware of that information at the time. Okay, you don't have conscious awareness of that information coming into your brain, but it has entered your midbrain. So because when we discuss trauma, we have such a big thing to do with how the brain determines if it's a threat or not, and that information coming into midbrain, midbrain, and like, did the information even get into the higher cortical areas or not due to the survival mechanisms, right? This is that whole thing about trauma physiologically. So Porgus... I think that's how we say his name. I, I have never heard it pronounced, so I'm hoping I'm getting it right. But anyway, he created this term neuroception. We're getting back around to it, guys. He created the term neuroception to refer specifically to that perceptual processing that happens at the midbrain level. Okay. So neuroception is literally just talking about the perception of incoming stimuli to the amygdala and the other like midbrain limbic system. Okay. So he basically come up with a different term than perception because neuroscience wise, that's typically people mean you've hit the higher cortical areas if you're perceiving something. But since we're not talking about that neocortex, we're talking about midbrain structures and them possibly like signaling in a survival response without the neocortex getting input and that's the trauma response, then that's why he came up with this new term, this neuroception, okay? And so this neuroception level, this midbrain level, is where we get into his polyvagal theory. Does that make sense? So like the neuroception is what's deciding which branch of the vagus is going to be in charge, I think is kind of his idea there. I believe that's it. I might have gotten that a little bit off, but I think that's right. Okay. <laughs> Talking myself, I'm talking myself up. Ah. All right. Okay. So Porges in his 2009 paper actually said, um, neuroception, this is a direct quote, uh, but it's been edited a little by me, but neuroception emphasizes a neural process that is capable of distinguishing environmental and visceral features that are safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. Okay. Does that make sense? So that's what he means by neuroception. It's essentially where that survival mechanism gets engaged because neuroception is how he's describing the processing that's happening in that midbrain and the decisions that are getting made there. All right. So in the scenario I use to kind of explain the entire cascade in the polyvagal theory, I use the scenario of a person walking alone at night and maybe they get mugged or threatened or something at knife point. This may or may not have had something to do with me listening to a podcast about the original OG 1970, what is it, 78, 79 Superman 
77? Was that when it came? I don't forget when they came. 78? I think it's 78. Anyway, might have had something to do with that because like that Lois Lane's kind of tough. Like she's just like, yeah, whatever. Okay. About, <laughs> about stuff. But anyway, that was my scenario. Uh, so in this scenario, the ventral vagal complex is active and it's connecting to the visceral, the like gut input to the membrane structures. So neuroception starts to occur. Okay. So per van der Kolk, the first response to be social person would call out for help. That's not part of polyvagal theory. That's just part of van der Kolk. Okay. Let's say nobody comes though. So then that amygdala and limbic system would take over sending the person into fight or flight mode. Okay. It is at this point that the person's neuroception is working to determine if fighting would be a good reaction or if running would give the person the best chance of survival, okay, or safety, okay? If the person is trained in combat and could knock the assailant's knife out of their hand with ease, then that person's neuroception might conclude that fight is the best response. If, like most of us, or like myself, this is not the case, then the person's limbic system might decide to run, all right? So they might decide to, f- to flee, At both of those stages, the person's ventral vagal complex is continuing to work to combine visceral responses and cortical processing at the social, i.e. frontal portion of the brain, initially in the social response, and then at the midbrain, the neuroception levels in the second response. Does that make sense? So the VVC is active when you're yelling for help, but the VVC is also still active even when, if that one fails, you're doing the neuroception decision of fight or flight. Okay. Okay. If none of these responses are determined to be safe, uh, so let's say the person decides they can't really fight and maybe they can't run fast enough to to successfully flee, then the ventral vagal complex would deactivate and the dorsal vagal complex would activate. At this point, the person goes into the freeze response wherein visceral processing is still occurring but at the level of the brainstem. So this is that theory. So instead of it being now at the neuroception level, it's actually lower in more of a brainstem level. Neuroception is not occurring at this stage because the amygdala and limbic system requires the ventral vagal complex input to be actively involved in processing information. Once the freeze response occurs, the person is effectively dislocating from the situation or dissociating. I think that's what I meant to say. The person is effectively dissociating from the situation. It is still an adaptive response, however, in that if the person is able to successfully appease the assailant, like giving them their wallet, for example, then the assailant might walk away and the person escapes the situation physically unharmed. That does not mean, however, they are not psychologically and emotionally unharmed, but that is essentially what the topic of trauma response is, right? So that's getting into a much denser discussion. So that's the idea behind polyvagal. It sounds really cool, right? The idea that, okay, you have this membrane processing, that's your fight or flight, and then when you go into freeze, the reason it looks so different physiologically is because it's actually now more in the midbrain structures or more of a reptilian brain, basically. He's basically saying it's going down more to that ancient reptilian brain level, and it's all dorsal vagal complex, uh mitigated. So you might hear that DVC, VVC. If you ever hear that in a training anywhere else, that is what the person's talking about. They're talking about the polyvagal theory. It's really cool. I really like it. I love this theory. I kind of want it to be true, but I'm not going to present it in the primary like uh, body of stuff I'm going to talk about. Because like I said, what I was looking into is that I think in the neuroscience world and the research world, There's really no solid evidence that humans even have the DVC, the dorsal vagal complex, uh, the way that some animals do. Uh, I think prey animals in particular have the dorsal vagal complex. And so I think it's one of those things where we see it in animal models and we do see the behavioral change in humans, but I don't think there's ever been any like converging evidence in humans due to brain scans or, or what have you that really prove that this is what's happening and that the midbrain is being downregulated to the point that it's really just in the brainstem at that point. This is also where people tend to get that theory that the freeze response becomes more parasympathetic. And I believe that has been disproven. I believe it, it has been more disproven that it is still sympathetic dominant at that point based off of like more current, uh, 
research articles I've read and also like, like research articles, like what they're giving me in the background of those research articles a lot of times. Cause sometimes the ones that actually prove it are ones behind a paywall and I haven't accessed them. So full disclosure there, I haven't always read all the literature cause I'm not involved in a new university. So, <laughs> and I tell you what guys, like ResearchGate is great. You can go on there. You can request, request articles from authors and hopefully get a free copy, but it doesn't always happen. Not everybody always gives you a free copy. So, and it does take, take some time because you like request it and then you're like, hopefully they get back to me and hopefully I get the article. And then sometimes it's like three months later, it's like, oh, here's that article you requested. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That person decided to log in, you know, three months after my request or so. So like, Trying to do true academic research outside of university is not the easiest thing in the world. I just have to say that because thanks paywalls behind research that's publicly funded in the U.S. So it sounds really silly that we have a paywall, but that's another issue. So I really shouldn't get into it here. <gasps> okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so that's the jam. That's the deal with polyvagal theory. That is my presentation of it. Uh, hopefully that helps a bit if you ever encounter it, if you ever hear it, uh, you have a little better understanding of what it's trying to say. The fight, flight, or freeze cascade that I explained is, I think, as far as I know, the most accurate thing we know at the moment when it comes to the research. So polyvagal is not as accurate anymore. Um, it sounds fancy. It sounds awesome. It is seen in animal models, but we don't know if we can really apply it to humans. So, um, I actually, this might be entertaining to USLPs. I actually encountered a forum where a lot of neuroscience graduate students were like, uh, I guess a student, or maybe it was, maybe it was a psychology psychology or psychiatry student. I'm not sure, but the student encountered the idea that this theory isn't accurate and they were like, clinicians, why would you ever use this with clients? Or why do you continue to talk about this theory, even if it's not accurate and it's been effectively disproven? Uh, in humans, essentially. And a lot of people were like, look, this theory has some good stuff to it, right? Like as a model, as a way of conceptualizing and thinking about the survival cascade being different between fight or flight or freeze response and being able to conceptualize that your midbrain is doing some processing to the information and making decisions on its own without the awareness of it, the neuroception piece, like it's, it's still some good stuff in there that can help clarify things to people effectively. Right. And then the research, but it's inaccurate. Why would you? Right. And a lot of times clinicians were like, I'm not really giving them this theory. I'm just letting them know that like, there's evidence that yes, freeze response is different. And this is why you responded that way. Because a lot of people who go into freeze response, talk about feeling a little crazy or a lot of times, especially in the case of women, um, or just smaller people in general who have some sort of violent interaction with someone who, when they go into a freeze response, there's a sense of shame for not fighting back. And that's a way that my understand, you know, a lot of mental health people will be like, it's a natural response to your body. It was a response to survive and you survived. It did its job. There is no shame in going into freeze response versus fight or flight. That is not something you were in control of consciously. And also literally all it was, the point was to survive. So it's fine. Like it's good that you did that because you survived. It worked like congratulate your brain for making a decision that worked basically. So because a lot of times freeze, freeze response is something I feel like is not really well understood colloquially. And so, you know, you get on like the Twitter horrible storms of like, if there's a horrible news article, then people are like, why wouldn't they fight back? I would totally fight back. And that's part of that. Like hindsight is 2020 thing. Cause it's like, well, what your brain chooses in terms of survival mechanisms, isn't really consciously up to you at the time it's being chosen. So like, don't judge people if they just go into a freeze response, they, their brain did what it needed to do. And if they survived the situation, it worked great. Not that there's any shame if somebody doesn't survive the situation if they're truly un a, a very unfortunate victim of it. Um, there's no shame to that either because once again, their brain tried and it did its best and there are forces in this world and there are humans in this world we can't survive against. And that's just how that goes. Unfortunately, uh, kind of dark guys. Sorry. That's a dark note to end on, but that's basically how life goes, right? There are forces of nature out there. We can't always defend against, so, and there's also humans with very dangerous intent and very dangerous 
ideas and whatever that you can't always defend against as much as you want to, right? Okay, that was my little bit of bonus content. Helps explain the polyvagal theory a little bit. Uh, hopefully you like the info dump on that one. Woo! And a little bit, a little bit of neuroscience. Got a little bit in there. You know, a little bit. A little sprinkling, a little dash, a little bam! Kicking it up a notch of, uh, <laughs> of like sensation versus perception in the neuroscience world. Because it's a little different than how we think about it in the SLP world and clinically also. Like, I think clinicians in general tend to think of it a little differently. Um, but... I just thought that was funny because when you talk to clinicians and how they conceptualize things to make it work clinically, it's like we tend to stay more broad than researchers do. And then researchers kind of get a bug in their butt because we're like more broad with it. It's like, well, we're more broad with it because like we can't generalize this hyper specific thing. Right. It's like we're doing the best we can, but we're also we're seeing all the variations that are out there that don't fit the little research box, you know? So, uh, it's just kind of funny. We have different jobs effectively, you know, researchers and clinicians. Neither are better than the other. Both really should be like relying on each other. But unfortunately, humans like to feel superior. And so I think that's where we get into trouble because it's like, you know, if we just both parties respected one another really well, then maybe, we, you know, maybe we would like, you know, have better discussions and stuff. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But this is also another soapbox I'm getting into. I need to stop myself. Stop ADHD brain. Okay. You guys, I hope you like this. Have a good one. Bye.